This is the Anything Show with John Francois, featuring Andrew Vanderton. Have you been keeping up with the royal family stuff uh, as of late, Andrew? Um, now I know that the old girl's gone. She's at <laughs> the building, and she said, "I'm on my way home." Um, but I don't know. Is there more drama? Is there other things happening? Well, uh, the, so you're, you're right. The old girl, otherwise known as Queen Elizabeth II, is is gone. Um, I think even before she died, her grandsons, William and Harry, had some tensions. Uh, their wives, uh, Megan and Kate, had some tensions. So it was sort of like this weird, uh, I mean, I don't know. Did, did, did Game of Thrones have family tensions like this? Oh, all the time. I mean, there were tensions and then there was tension. It was like, oh, okay. Like, yeah. you go to dinner and as opposed to saying, I'm sorry for waking you up this morning, you like poison your brother. It's... <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, something like that. I mean, they, uh, in fact, there was a uh, recent news story that I read about Kate trying to heal the wounds with Megan uh, during his trip to Boston. And I mean, wouldn't that be a great thing for Megan's podcast? I don't know if you knew that Megan Markle has a podcast. I didn't know she had a podcast. I didn't know she had a podcast. I'm going to have to check it out and listen. I haven't listened to it yet. I just know about it because I, you know, I, I do radio for a living, so I just know about all things pop culture. But um, yeah, I mean, she has she's had like Mariah Carey on um, and some other people I can't think of right now. Uh, but uh, I think that this is a great way to uh, talk about uh, estranged family members because I think we've all have those family members that we talk to, and then those family members that we maybe don't want to have to do with anything or maybe they just are just not in our lives for whatever reason um but i think that uh you know for me for example i mean i would say that this situation reminds me of how long it's been since i had any sort of normal uh, personal relationship with my dad. W what about you, Andrew? Did, did you have a family member uh, c c kind of similar like that? I think you said your uncle, uh, you know, is someone who you're just like, man, I don't really know. Yeah, it's one of my uncles where it's really just like, I see you when I see you. I don't really have much to say to you. There's nothing to really say. And unfortunately, it just stems from childhood where it's like, they were so afraid of me being gay that they didn't understand that their actions to help me not be gay were hurting me more than just letting me be a happy, free thinking kid. And because of that, as an adult now, you know, you go through therapy, you process these things, you realize it's like, I don't really have much to say to you at all. And I don't really think you're entitled to know anything about my life. So I'll see you at Thanksgiving and we'll talk about the cornbread. Yeah, and I, and I and I gotta think. I mean, that's gotta be interesting to be like, because I know family holiday dinners that that that's always been a thing, but to be in the same room as somebody who doesn't seem to fully accept you as who you are. I mean, that isn't that strange. It is. It's strange. It's weird, especially when it's people that are supposed to be family. Because then you go in and they have this expectation of like, oh, hey, we're family. So we're just going to sit here and kind of move past everything. And it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Because even after we move past whatever issue there could have been, let's say I got a fantastic apology and it's like, hey, let's move on. I then can't come to you and say, hey, this is who I'm dating in my life. Because still to this day, that would be something you would criticize shame or say that I'm evil for or going to hell and it's like section of my life I can't let you experience you don't get to experience the happiest moments in my life and that's by your own choice so there's not much I can really do to be like oh let's get past it it's kind of just like hey we exist because we're in the same bloodline but that's really it <laughs> yeah yeah boy yeah I, I don't know I don't know how you do it, man. I mean, my, my experience, I, I, look, I'm fortunate enough to uh, have family members that have, you know, in a general sense, it seems like they, they've been, you know, accepting with um, whatever person that I've become. Um, I think the reason why 
I mentioned my dad as an estranged family member. By the way, how do you even say that word? Estranged? 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 Estranged. Estranged is, I think that'll be classy. It's got like a little zing to it. Mm-hmm. Estranged. Look at my croissant. I'm estranged. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. But yeah, no, um, you know, to tr- not to ramble about, uh, you know, the story with my dad. I mean, pretty much, um, you know, him and my mom had a, a falling out like, you know, some parents do. And um, he left. And when he did, it just caused a lot of confusion for me because it was it was like, OK, I know that as the father, you're supposed to be here, you know, for the family, providing the support, providing the love, all that stuff at the same time, because I never had the closest relationship with my dad when he was around. There was also, there there was, there was also sort of this weird sort of feeling of relief that like, Oh, okay. This family member that I have to try to figure out a relationship with, I guess I'm off the hook now is because he's just, where he is so this was like back in 2010 that you know my mom and my dad separated and uh, I was just sort of bouncing around between you know the feelings of you know letting someone go that you really never had a close relationship with but also knowing like how his absence affected my mom I mean because she was the sole provider she had to take care of three kids and you know make sure you know we were fed and and we were able to go to school and such Um, and you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess the, the, those, the, 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 you know, those, those strange, confusing feelings of relief turned into sort of an angst, sort of a rebellion, sort of an anger at him, maybe some feelings of frustration toward my mom as well. Um, and then it just got to a point like in 2017, when I was in Iowa for um, one of my earlier radio gigs, um, I think my mom brought my dad up in a conversation on the phone in a way where I said to myself, okay, I think it's time to email him because uh, at that point, I mean, we're talking seven years into the separation, uh, his communication, him being in another country, his home country, by the way, Haiti. And I think he's still there right now. um, I mean, really email was the primary way that he would uh, keep in touch with the family members that uh, would want to keep in touch with him. (laughs) And um, I, I guess I had gotten word from my mom that he had been trying to email me from email addresses that I just never really used anymore. So I guess that is what got me to uh, re- respond to his emails and pretty much uh, give an entire essay about the uh, the roller coaster of feelings I had about you know how he and my mom separated. And you know to my dad's credit, he was very understanding about how I felt and. Uh, told his side of the story. And then from there, I think for like about a couple years or so, we had in a, what, what I would call an occasional email relationship where uh, he'd check in every now and then on, you know, birthdays, maybe holidays, uh, other occasions, and I'd respond back to him. And then I think for me, it just got to a point where I uh, didn't really see much value and just keeping it as like this strictly email thing with at this point in my life, some guy from another country. Um, I remember I told him at length about, uh, you know, my job and, you know, at the time, you know, you know, my girlfriend, Tony, who's now my fiance. Um, and like, I put a lot of effort into that essay of, of an email and I sent it out into the internet spear for him to hopefully respond. I never got a response back. And I guess in that non-response that gave me time to think about the kind of relationship that I would prefer at this point with him, which is just more of a distant thing, more of an acceptance thing of like, okay, you were here uh, for the first 18 years of my life. So literally my childhood, Um, I'm now 30. Um, and you know, when you were here, you, you, you gave the love, you gave the financial support, you, you, you provided me basic morals, nothing wrong with that. Um, and then you left and now I'm grown, I'm independent, I'm doing my own thing. And now I think it's just gotten to a point where, especially with him, probably not coming back from the country of Haiti, uh, it's just like, eh, 
I, I think we're done. I, I think we're good. I think that, uh, you know, for example, I mean, Tony, when we, when, when her and I were planning our wedding and the guest list and stuff like that, she had understandably asked me if I wanted to invite him. And I'm like, eh, I don't think so. Because, uh, you know, if I'm going to have anybody there on that special day, it's people currently in my life. Uh, you know, fa- family members that I, you know, see every now and then, friends that I see every now and then, you, of course, you know, we, we've developed a great friendship through the podcast. Um, you know, just people that are actually in my life physically and, and really mean something to me because of it. Um, so, you know, I don't know, you know, some people listening uh, to this may think like, oh, well, you know, you're trying to, you know, kind of push away pain or whatever. And it's like, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think that I've said what I had to say to him about how I felt about the whole separation. And now it's just, you know, okay, if you're going to be in that country and I'm going to be in this country and we're we're going to be living our separate lives like this many miles away from each other, then I, I think I'm content with just moving on and just acknowledging that, all right, you were a father at this time in my life. And now I'm going my own, own separate way. So I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make any sense? <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. You have moments in your life now as an adult that you can process it and comprehend it in a different way than you would have when you were younger. And you have the right to say, this is my happy moment. This is my happiness. You're not just welcome to it just because we're family. It's a respect thing that has to be there and one for loving yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, So I think that, uh, you know, in a way, just being able to talk about both of our estranged or estranged family member experiences can be uh, therapeutic in its uh, own sense. Um, And uh, look, here's, here's what I will say. Uh, I think we, in our own unique ways, uh, had enough reason to look at these family members when they completely hurt us at a time and be like, you know, I wish you were dead. Uh, but luckily you and I have got, have gotten to a classy place where we have said, you know what? Uh, I accept that this is the way you are. I definitely accept that this is the way I am. And we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, that's it. I mean, we'll sit down again. We'll have dinner or do whatever we do during the holidays but it's kind of like you're just a blip on the radar you're not my whole sphere of life you're just out there yeah be honest was there ever one point in your life when uh you just wanted to pull a jeffrey dahmer on your uncle aside from the sex stuff aside from the sex stuff (laughs) (laughs) i won't lie there is, there was, and I was like, ugh, so just angry in that moment in my life where I was like, this is just the worst thing that I could experience. I get bullied all day long at school, and then I have to come home and experience this. I'm like, no, no, I hate it. Yeah. Did you say you had to go to this guy's wedding, or was it a per- different person? It's a completely different person. Okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, uh, speaking of uh, all things uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, I, look, I, hopefully you don't take offense to this, Andrew, but when you told me that you just absolutely loved the Dahmer series on Netflix, I was like, you know what? I just had a feeling that Andrew would love this. I just had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I love true crime stuff. Jeffrey Dahmer is not somebody to idolize or anything like that, but I do love the acting, the storytelling in it giving a voice to some of the victims. I do have some issues with the families not being paid if they're not being paid. So I hope these families got paid for all this money that was made from it. But the acting is very good. So it's one of those things where I say, it's good, I enjoy it, but I did not need it and the rest of the world did not need it. We all knew about Jeffrey Dahmer and we did not need another retelling of it. Mm. Uh, I wasn't super familiar with his story. So this was sort of... um a newish thing for me to go into. Uh, I will say to your point about hoping that the uh, victims or the victims' families got paid, um, reading into this, pretty much all of the the family members of the victims in real life uh, do not like this show at all. And they said they were not aware of uh, Netflix doing this. So I would not be surprised if they were not paid a single penny for this. It it would not surprise me. It wouldn't. It's terrible. It's unfair. It's not acceptable. And that's why Netflix, I didn't pay to watch it. 
<laughs> oh, did you like mooch off of someone's account? Oh, no, I found a little bootleg website and I watched it right on there. I refuse to pay for it. They won't get my money. Oh, my God. That's awesome. That's like the equivalent of you saying, like, I, I didn't pay for the baby's new music. I just, you know, bootlegged it off of some, you know, pirated website. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, that's what I'll do for that. I just, again, I love true crime stuff. I always been obsessed with learning about different things like that just as an own hobby of mine in researching those things but we didn't need this we didn't need it it's a good acting series i'm happy that people got paid from it but the families should have been respected there could have been a lot more tact if you're not even going to tell these people that this is coming out you could have at least told the family what was going to happen and then on top of that pay those people pay them they had to go through this and now you're making millions of dollars. Pay those people. Yeah. And I'm sure our special guests on this episode would highly agree with you, Andrew. Um, she played not only uh, the maternal figure on the classic show, The Waltons from the 70s and 80s. Somehow her career got to a point where she is the grandmother of a uh, sick serial killer series called Dahmer on Netflix. Uh, the second most popular English language show for Netflix ever at this point. I think it's over like 700 million hours watched. Uh, her name is Michael Learned. So I'm going to be talking with her and, you know, good. Uh, wish me luck, Andrew, because, uh, you know, God, when you talk to, to the grandmother of a well-known serial killer, anything can happen. I wish you luck. I would just love to tell her she made me cry. She is an amazing actress. She made me cry, boohoo crying on one of the episodes she's in because it was that good. Me and Tony uh, watched the first three episodes. So we've only watched one episode that Michael was in. Um, so, and, and from what I've read in the Wikipedia thing about Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, the grandmother plays a really, really big role in uh, where he stores his victims. Um, so I look forward to seeing more of Michael's performance in the show. Before we go, Andrew, how can we find you on the social media? You can find me on the social media on the tickies of the talks. <laughs> J underscore Vandertunt. Or you can find me on Instagram at AJ Vandertunt. I think oh. oh, sorry. Sorry. I think your audio cut out because I was talking over you. Say that one more time. At uh, What was your social media handle? AJ underscore Vandertunt. That's how you can find only on the two socials now. I'm not doing anything else. There's too many out there now. Yeah, it's like streaming services, you know? Yes. There's some really ones that are like out there, like out there, out there. And there's other ones where it's like somebody create a social media Sailor Moon website. I'll be on that one. I love it. I love it. All right. Without further ado, Michael Learned, the grandmother in the hugely popular Netflix series Dahmer, right now on the Anything Show. You know, television, as you probably know, it, it seems a lot different uh, today than it was, say, 50 years ago when you uh, broke out in the scene on the, on the Waltons. And, you know, looking at your role as Jeffrey Dahmer's grandmother today, do you think that a series based on this real life, you know, cannibalistic necrophiliac serial killer. Do you think that would have worked back then uh, when, when, when you were uh, doing television for the Waltons? What a good question. No, I don't think so. I think uh, we've become hardened as a nation. You know, we've become tougher and more hip, if you will, or hep. I don't know which, whether it's hip or hep, but um, we're sort of more, I hate the term woke, but uh, you know, people are more sophisticated in in, in many ways. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think it ever would have gotten on television back then because nobody could could have watched it. Um, we were we were too sensitive, really. I remember once years ago when I was maybe uh, about fifteen, watching a documentary on PBS, and um, it showed a um, an African tribe and one of the 
one of the ways uh, they could discover whether a killer was uh, a murderer or not was to feed feed the the person poison, uh, make them drink poison. And if they died, they were guilty, and if they didn't die, they were innocent. And I watched a man drink the poison and fall over and die, and I couldn't sleep for a week and a half. Um, you know, I was so upset by that. But now you go and see brains being splattered across a wall and eyes being gouged out of people. <laughs> oh, yeah, ho-hum. Now, um, yeah, I was just reading an article, uh, you know, based on an interview that you did. I think you did the interview with Fox News Digital, and you had mentioned that uh, you were concerned about the, the direction that this country is taken based on our fascination with serial killers like Jeffrey, uh, like Jeffrey Dahmer. So I guess this leads me to ask you, what, what led you to want to take the role of his grandmother in this Dahmer series? Work. I'm an actor. I like to work. And uh, working with Ryan Murphy was, was a lure. And Richard Jenkins, and I didn't know Evan at the time, but I, I mean, I didn't know him personally at all, but it was, uh, he, he's a delightful person to work with. He's very generous as an actor, and absolutely without any airs of, of any kind, he's just a guy. A friendly, very friendly actor and a very nice person, and, um, a, and my scenes with him were actually easy to play and easy to love because he was very... He's, a, he's such a good actor that you sort of like him, and uh, I didn't like anything I saw of Jeffrey Dahmer on the on the real life. Uh, he was sort of cold, and he, he, he was such a cold and detached uh, person in real life. But Evan seemed to bring some warmth to him. Right, right. So uh, you think that if Evan wasn't such a um a wonderfully generous actor to work with. Do you think you would have been caught up in the d- disturbing uh, facts behind the material? Well, yeah, my, my job was to be, to not know. My job was to be in denial. I mean, that's, I, I mentioned earlier that I have a grandson living with me. He's 28 years old, and he's just gorgeous in every way, and I am biased, but it's true. He is. He's, he's gorgeous to look at, and he's sweet and kind, and um, if somebody came up to me and said, well, you know what he's really doing behind your back, I, I wouldn't believe it. So I, I can understand how this woman was totally unaware of the fact that her grandson was chopping up bodies in her basement. It, it's a little hard to fathom, but I think I think if I had had a smell coming of dead bodies coming up through my kitchen, I would have gone down to investigate. But for some reason, she never did, at least not in the series which is weird. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's her grandson, and she thinks the world of him, so she does have that bias, of course. Um, I wanted to ask you about the criticism that's been um, uh, seen from the from the actual, like, real-life families of, of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims. You know, criticism uh, directed toward the series, uh, you know, saying that, oh, it didn't really happen like that, or this is unnecessary, re-traumatizing. Like, you know, as, as one of the actors in this series that they're targeting, I mean, what, what do you make of that criticism? I can understand it. I have compassion for them. It must be very painful for them, uh, in a way, glorifying these people. It, even if they're, you're showing their negative twisted, sick side, you are glorifying them by even making a film about them, I guess. So I can understand how the families must feel some very mixed emotion. Do you think that there's, uh, do do, do you think that this uh, series that you're involved in, uh, do you think it takes a more of a uh, investigative, informative side into Jeffrey Dahmer, maybe an educational lesson as to what not to do, like not to, you know, treat people this way? Or uh, do you think that there is, you know, a little bit of entertainment, exploitative uh, of nature that's that's going on here, just to, you know, keep eyeballs? I think most of what Ryan Murphy does is dark. Um, whether it's... Uh, I, I don't know what his motives for wanting to produce these things is, uh, 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 but... He's produced a lot of really kind of dark stuff, and um, I don't want to feel sorry for a serial killer. Um, you you have to know that somewhere there was 
something that was, you know, I, I watched a lot of his interviews, and he said, I think there was something wrong with my brain, and I think there must have been. A lot of kids have a mother who takes too many pills and, a, and, a, and go through a divorce in the family, and they don't turn into serial killers. So what was it about him? I don't even think he was malicious. I don't think he was out to hurt anybody. He just, there was some monster, you know, monster is the term. There was just something in him that was immune to uh, having any conscience about what he was doing to people. I mean, can you imagine? He was a cannibal. It's, it's, it's disgusting to even talk about. I mean, just, just you know, smashing bones with, with a hammer. I mean, just everything that he did uh, was just out of this world. And like you said, when he confessed to the killings, just uh, the sort of lackadaisical way that he did so, it's like, wow, I mean, this is not, this is not a human. Um, now, I mean, you know, his, his later killing in prison, I mean, do you think that was, that, that was justified? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that you guys... Uh, Covered that in the series. I'm only three episodes in, by the way, but uh, I'm, I'm going to guess that that's kind of covered. Well, you know, I have to say I, I wasn't sorry when he was killed. Um, but, um, you know, I, I sat next to a I was on a train once going from New York to Connecticut. I lived in Connecticut as a young woman. And, um, and a guy came in and sat down next to me. He had a kind of narrow suit on a, a, and 60s hair, you know, and he, from a distance, he looked pretty put together. But when he sat down next to me, he had a smell of someone who had hadn't washed, and his suit was kind of dirty. And he started talking to me, and he said, he, he said, what do you think, what would you think if, if somebody pushed a, a dresser over on a three-year-old boy? And I said, what? That's terrible. And he said, yeah. And then he started going on, and how would you... How would you feel about if somebody put a little boy's hand on a hot stove? And, you know, I mean, I realized I was sitting next to an absolutely crazy person, and I, I hope to God that he... I got off the train. I said, you need therapy, and you need help. And I, I got off the train. I, I just... It was chilling. And so I have no idea. I hope to God he wasn't a killer himself. But... He was certainly, I, I really saw how you can sit next to somebody on a bus and have no idea of who they really are. Yeah, wow. Well, Michael Learned, I mean, this uh, this has been a great conversation. I mean, I, I don't even need to promote this show because it is the second most popular show on Netflix right now. I think over like 700 million hours watched uh, Dahmer on Netflix. So uh, I, uh, what I have to say is uh, congratulations from what I've seen of your performance. It is just uh, definitely astonishing, phenomenal. Uh, of, of course, Evan Peters is, is just out of this world as Dahmer. Uh, so I, I do thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for having me. The Anything Show with John Francois is on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. Join us on YouTube, Facebook.com slash The Anything Show, and Instagram and TikTok at Anything Show Francois. Join Andrew Vandertunt, Instagram and TikTok at AJ Vandertunt.